Exactly. Welcome to the 110th edition of Yahex TV. And as our attendees are saying, uh, the Java is the fountain of youth, which, uh, of course, everyone can testify here because there are already 110 episodes and we look exactly the same as seven years ago. So that, that, that's actually the interesting part of Java. Um, yeah, this is... And, and another no proof of concept or proof of concept, uh, why it works that well, is the Duke looks exactly the same now. Maybe even be, be a little bit, you know, how to call it, fresher or a little bit more... Um, playful than at the beginning so of Java. So everything looks great. Um, okay, so let's start um, with, because I always forget that, or not always, uh, sometimes forget that, I always like to start with the time travel first. And um, this was uh, the beginning of 2015, was the 10th episode of uh, Airhex TV. And um, so I, I introduced Project Headlands. It's hard to believe what Headlands was. It's actually primitive projects, but I use it a lot. It exposed via arrest, via REST uh, uh, Hazelcast. And why the name Headlands is, um, I got the idea at Java 1. I took a walk and there, was a, there were some hills and um, they were called Headlands. And um, I got the idea of the project and I had no idea about the name. So I call it Headlands. Still up to date, but I don't use it a lot right now, but still usable. Now, um, the, the uh, third question is interesting. What are your overall Java E favorites? And um, so, and you will see a little bit later that uh, someone says, for instance, it's inter interesting. What application server are you currently using for your Java E7 projects? Would you recommend Glassfish despite, despite the lack of commercial support? What's interesting is that after uh, seven years uh, now, Qu uh, the Quarkus, Glassfish is actually back. So uh, Glassfish, there's a company around Glassfish, and it provides provides support for uh, for Glassfish. And it's not Payara, uh, it's called Piranha. And um, so what it means is after seven years, the situation actually got, got better. So... Um, Project Avatar is dead, but it was an interesting attempt. Um, so, portable error reporting with Jaxores uh, 2.0. It's actually what we do right now. Uh, we, what, I mean, portable error reporting. What I do, I subclass web application exceptions, and then, you know, the uh, exceptions are just automatically translated to, uh, to HTTP errors. Um, what I also do is the point eight right now. So we actually serialize the entire Java object hierarchy in JSON, and it's quite complex, but not you know, not normalized, and it works surprisingly well. And I'm using right now JSON B, but we could use uh, Jackson or whatever, and maybe we will use it to to because JSON B is not the fastest, but it works surprisingly well. Okay, now uh, the next one. So we had this. Um, okay, I'm with modular JSF applications. Less interesting right now. I would say uh, HTML and JavaScript just just one. Um, building um, enterprise systems made of multiple years. I mean, it's also you know um, this is um, out of fashion. I was or out of fashion. I I don't even think back then I was you know uh, for for it. What I what I proposed. I would say maybe starting. 2015 and earlier, always, you know, one application server, one war per application server, and um, we'll still do it. And today, maybe I present you an idea for shared deployments again, which is uh, what, what I thought about that. And um, so this is not Arunia rather than Aryuna. Uh, so this is a corner case. Let's skip that. Session scoped and stateless, also no more relevant. And, but, 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 they were somewhere... Well, this, number four. So interestingly, JavaFX is not supported by Apple, but it actually is. So the situation improved for JavaFX. Now it um, it is supported by several companies. You could actually use it. Um, what's also interesting, Vardin is still relevant, even with web components in Java. GWT, um, I don't know what, M -J -M -J -J -M mobile GWT, I guess. So G And PhoneGap. So PhoneGap is no more relevant. GWT... Um, indirectly with Vardin, but uh, what I would, I think right now, 
what what happened is uh, web component or in my projects, you know, HTML and uh, and JavaScript just won, and and modern CSS. So modern CSS standards kills a lot of CSS frameworks, and uh, TypeScript I think is very popular. I still use JavaScript because for me, you know, I don't like the precompilers or whatever, but it, it gets very similar experience to TypeScript. And I use web components, and there are frameworks. I would say, w what happens right now? We get less and less front-end frameworks. This is actually the, this is actually the trend. Okay, so this was the time travel. Then uh, let's take a look. Um, okay, let's do the podcast. I had a nice conversation because I see in the chat are questions regarding Lambda. I had a really nice conversation with Maximilian Schellhorn of AWS. And because uh, Java 17 was announced uh, support for Lambda uh, on Friday, and we released the episode on, uh, on, on, on Saturday. And it was not just, just about... Um, uh, AWS and Lambda. We also had, you know, thoughts, or we we uh, we, ex we we talk about uh, serverless Java in general, and um, and interestingly, uh, Max uh, was a Kotlin developer, and now he uh, uses Java 17 and says, okay, Java is enough. So we had a conversation about that because I get to you know constantly asked question why I'm not using Kotlin, and Maximilian used Kotlin, and um, yeah, and we had a chat why he switches back to Java. Okay, so might be interesting for you. And of course, uh, around the quarter, actually, uh, June the 15th, AWS Java Bootstrap, where we would do, you know, hardcore <laughs> bootstrap with VPCs, IPs, and whatever uh, tools, serverless. This was fast track. So I got the idea because I always did the bootstrap for Java E. I got lots of requests, requests regarding AWS, so let's do the uh, uh, bootstrap. And uh, then cost-driven architectures with Java. This is actually what I'm doing all the time. Is okay? How to you know design uh, applications which will survive in the cloud? So this is actually the idea. Okay. So now enough ads. Uh, next one. Um, let's see. Just close the chat. Um, oh. Lots of questions. So I also make it larger. Okay, interview questions. So um I someone asked me about interview questions last time and my answer was not really good because I said and I will ask you what what do you like about computers? And what is your favorite editor? How your desktop looks looks like? Which I will also ask you, but this is of course not enough because you could pass in you know, all the interview without even knowing about programming. So I, I just stopped there the last time, which was uh, not good. So um, if I had the chance to interview you, what I also will ask, for instance, let's say we have to build an application which, let's say, manages AirHex TV episodes. So would you like to use cloud? Or be on premise. So, what's what's your opinion about that? So, this would be the first question. Let's say uh, the next one would be: um, Let's imagine you know we have uh, or why we you we need load balancer, for instance, right? Or um, why we need Docker? What are the pros and cons of Docker? And and what I would be interested in is in your argumentation, and not necessary whether you know you know exactly how Docker works because it doesn't actually matter. So this is so. Um, I would say two parts. First, I would like to see um, how motivated are you, or do you have actually fun developing? And if um, yeah, and if say so, okay, it seems like you are now willing to learn new stuff and and you enjoy it a bit. If someone enjoys you know programming, then the chances are higher than she or he will actually learn it as well. And that the second part is you know. Um, to ask you questions about principles, actually, how you're thinking about things, right? Would you use relation database or NoSQL database? How you would choose? And um, what I don't like too much, you know, about fanatism in, in a specific, you know, library or whatever, like, you know, a few years ago, everything had to be reactive and, uh, and uh, or everything had to be, there were thin clients, there were fat clients and back and forth. So there should be, always should be a reason, reasons to do, to do that, right? Okay. 
So this would be the questions. And uh, sometimes, uh, or sometimes, what, what I also would try to do, you know, uh, ask you a question where uh, the answer is almost impossible to know. Like, for instance, uh, explain in view words how Paxos is working, right? And see, uh, if you say, I don't know, perfect. If you try, you know, to make it up is also perfect, but I, I would like just to see how you react to such a things because I would say we learn the entire time, and uh, at least in my case, and uh, I, I just recognize I, I know actually less and less. At least uh, it, uh, the, the, more you, the more you know, actually, the more you know that you don't know, right? So this is uh, um, almost, you know, almost proven. Or it isn't proven, actually. It's a logical, logical challenge, I think. Okay, interview questions done. So I was not happy with my answer last year, uh, last, year <laughs> last month. Um, the first real question is programmatic and portable JAXORS endpoint registration. And what I do in such cases, I look up the spec. So this is the most recent spec. And what you can do, what's defined, is the SE bootstrap. What's not defined is how the application servers are registering the endpoints. So um, Jersey is able to do that, but and REST Easy is able to do that, but I don't think there is a portable way to dynamically register endpoints. Uh, exactly the same as that there is no portable way to dynamically register entities. We did it with uh, Eclipse League, Eclipse Sync in one project. Mm -hmm. But uh, there is no easy way, or there is no portable way, not easy, no portable way to do that. So um, what I will do in your case, so I think you're running Whitefly, what I will do is I will just wrap your mechanism, which is REST easy dependent, in a class. And if you have to move move to Glassfish, just write another class. And uh, you know, if you cover all application servers, you, you, you will have five classes and you are basically done. So this would be the idea. Okay, next one. And let's take a look at the chat. So uh, what do we have? Um, yeah, Tiago, friend of the show, he's already, uh, he rewatches all the Airhex episodes and almost caught up, episode 88. Um, and now uh, Umong asked me, hey Adam, can you suggest a better replacement of Eric's Java reactor? What can be used to get similar performance and easy to debug? So I don't think reactor is faster than regular Java, what I suggest, uh, so, uh, what I what I what I think is that uh, re uh, Reactor is um, comes with more scalability, or it scales better and consumes m less memory on higher loads. This is this is my my guess. I never use Reactor, so uh, what I will do is I will just remove Reactor altogether and just write simple Java code and see how it performs. I wouldn't be surprised that it performs as well as the reactor. And then, if it doesn't perform well, maybe we get you know the next Java release, and we get Project Loom, which will make you know the reactive programming without reactive programming. Right? This is the interesting part. Um, yeah, today is the Ma May the first, which mean means this is an interesting you know. Uh, celebration day of work and how we celebrate work so that we don't work except in Netherlands what I learned today because uh, they are reasonable so I say if we celebrate work the only way to celebrate work is working and and not not working which is obvious perfect so how can I test Kafka with Quarkus so how I did so I just ignored the Quarkus capabilities of of, uh, of, of testing Kafka but what Quarkus is able to do is amazing. What Quarkus can even create topics on the fly. So maybe it helps you. But I always try, you know, to, to, to think, okay, how to test the system without being, you know, using too too many tools. First, what I always did, I created a small script which installs Kafka in my local folder from zip, uh, deletes the old installation and all the temp folders for Zookeeper and Kafka. So already this, in a, in a three seconds, you have Kafka installed in a local machine. If you have that, it is incredibly easy to uh, to um, to uh, to have always a fresh installation. So uh, sometimes we need test data. In this particular case, I always copy the state folder to this installation, and um, and it works, right? So this is the more or less how to call it how to get always a predictable state in the Kafka, right? So what Kafka can do, you can run, you can test Kafka streams, for instance, in Kafka with unit tests. But I try to avoid it because it's like 
fake test, right? So what I, I would apply exactly the same strategy what I do is AWS Lambda. So I get the question, how to test, you know, AWS Lambda? Very similar story because, uh, or Azure functions, because, you know, the functions are depend on something and uh, Kafka, Kafka streams depends on Kafka. So I try as soon as possible to abstract from, you know, for, let's say in, in, in the Kafka case, you get the message and you would like, you know, to convert the message in something, you know, uh, in a domain object. So if you have the domain object, then you, you can write regular unit tests without even affecting Kafka, right? The same is for Lambda. Lambda sent you a stream and you have to decode the stream to a JSON. If you have a JSON, you can write proper, you know, unit tests. This is what I do and it works really well. The question is, of course, what you would really like to test, right? If you would like to test the performance, you need different strategies. And in my current semi-project, you know, just project aside, uh, the uh, performance is the concern. So we test you know, performance a lot, but we don't have unit tests. Okay. Hopefully it was, it was uh, answer to your question. Tiago said, okay, that Netherlands is actually a nice country because they have lots of Java jobs, which is uh, very true. And now Logan was on my podcast. If you would like, you know, um, uh, to 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 know about Logan, listen to the podcast. And Brett Tucker was not on the podcast, but he was on Airhex TV. Has lots of experience with Glühwein, glowing wine. Ha! Huh. Um, our application is message driven. Streaming grows from the database. We are using Eric Java, and it is a pain. Yeah, I believe that because you know, usually uh, reactive um, streaming grows from database. So maybe you're using DynamoDB or something like this, seems like, or you're streaming grow, so you, you are, maybe you're using reactive driver because this is not, not usual. So um, SDK man is uh, is great. So Tiago asked me, what is my opinion about SDK man? Uh, I think it's great. I still don't need it because I don't have lots of JDKs installed. I usually running Java 17 uh, LTS and this is basically it. Uh, sometimes I try, you know, the newer one, but then I, sw I, I sw swap this with the uh, libexec, I think it's called, is the, the Apple built-in functionality, it's just one-liner, or I have an alias. So this is, but still, I'm, you know, I try to keep things simple, and this is with my script uh, just works. So I have like, you know, script like, you know, J8 or J9, which switches to J9 or, J or J10, yeah. Brett uh, says uh, Java is the fountain, uh, Java as the fountain of youth, use yeah, Brett, absolutely. So um, what happens on on Airhex? I got the idea that I could I can I can actually start the show earlier, and have some fun. So we have an informal conversation, and where we prove the point that Java keep us young. And of course, I'm Highlander, so this is also true. Now uh, SDK is great, and now Mister, oh Vuizo Vuizo A. Um, what do you suggest to use React over plain web components? Uh, I think um, it is possible because uh, I know some React com com um, developers who are really who really like React. What I see the problem right now is that React is a little bit you know not right now I don't know why I also like React but it's less popular than last year. So I, I would say the popularity decreases of React, and my impression is that the popularity of web components increases. So everyone talks about web components, and um, ah, whether I will pick TypeScript. So I don't pick TypeScript because for me, in with Visual Studio Code, this JavaScript behaves like TypeScript for me, so it is good enough. But um, if the project would be huge, maybe I will use TypeScript, but this is not my default. So nothing against TypeScript. Um, in all my projects right now, we are not using TypeScript, we're using JavaScript, and developers seem to be happy. And uh, but this is also not true because if you use plain JavaScript in Visual Studio Code, um, what Visual Studio Code does, it converts you know uh, the, uh, the the JavaScript classes to TypeScript, and um, yeah. So actually, I'm using TypeScript TypeScript without knowing it. Um, okay. Um, so now Ike asked me, is there is th is there limitations on Java on Lambda workload deployments? For example, file size processing limitations. Yeah, there is. There, there are timeout limitations, payload limitations, but they are depending whether you are using API gateway or uh, function URL or load balancer. And uh, and you cannot use you can use WebSockets, but differently. So you will have to use the API gateway. Of course, there are limits. 
but not from scalability pers oh, of course there are also scalability limits but uh, imagine that in lambda you get per call the entire lambda environment so if you say i would like to run with one cpu and 1.8 gig of ram and you start 1000 lambdas and the end of the day you have 1000 cpus and uh, 2 terabytes of ram right so roughly so this is yeah so um yeah but I, I would say for you know usual boring enterprise applications lambda is just fine padman asked me uh, why java e is still alive why spring boot not dominate it the world maybe it does i i, I don't know uh but um I would say Quarkus is getting more and more popular. No? This is at least my impression. So Quarkus gets uh, popular. What we also have with Helidon. Micronode is also uh, more and more popular. And why Spring uh, uh, um, would not dominate it the world? So because we we are running Java in 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 several locations. So list, listen, for instance, to the AWS Lambda talk, right, with uh, Max. For instance, um, what Quarkus and Micronode are doing, you can run a you know, Micronode or Quarkus without any problems um, on Lambda. With Spring, you can also do that, but you have to do something about that, right? So, and uh, Quarkus and Micronaut, to my knowledge, they are a little bit faster than, uh, than 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 Spring Boot startup time. So, and what it means is, um, then you will pay a little bit less with Lambda. So, this is this is maybe one of the reasons. So, I would say it's not like Spring dominates everywhere, and uh, we have Spring and Spring Boot. So, I would say. Uh, I don't think it's possible that one framework will dominate dominate the world. I think, right? If you take a look, you know, at Java, at Java one, <laughs> at uh, JavaScript, this is even crazier because you get you know millions of frameworks. And Angular was very popular. Now almost you know no more. And we say uh, it's not that popular as a few years ago. React is very popular, but also loses you know the attention. And and now we have Svelte and and Vue.js and other frameworks. Yeah. Logan, friend of the show, and hopefully Logan, you watched the movie. So this was your homework assignment, right? Planes, no, how old is airplanes, automobiles, and something rockets maybe. Um, glad to see seventeen supports. I hope twenty one support comes a lot quicker. Yeah, yeah, Logan. This was actually I said. Oh, so this was the homework assignment to my guests. Say, watch you no know, twenty one. It should be available immediately. Um. Padman, should I upgrade from Payara 5 to Payara 6? Absolutely. Always upgrade. Adam, in your opinion, how will JetGPT impact us developers? It will completely change, actually, how we work, I would say, because it's reality right now, and uh, we will use, you know, um, maybe it is JetGPT is the smartest tech overflow. And um, so I, I would say huge, impa huge impact. We cannot ignore it. and uh, But it will make us more productive and um, what I think, what what is, what is really I don't know dangerous, but um, I could, for instance, use ChatGPT in a language we, where I don't know a little. Let's say, Ada. Ada is a nice language because uh, because of my name. So, but then it, it will maybe work, but uh, I cannot imagine debugging or you know performance issues, corner cases. So I would say what will happen is that ChatGPT. Make uh, will make people who know the language incredibly productive, and maybe even you know developers who are not that proficient in the language less productive, or at the beginning crazy productive, and then it stops because the complexity is going to be huge and there is no concept, and then it's really hard to know to tell what the application is actually doing. So, uh, so I would say with ChatGPT you can be incredibly productive, but you will really focus on what you are doing, and you you should question every line of code. So this. This will be the impact. Yeah, Logan, Spring relies on Java E and even contributes to it. This, of course, this was also the, always the misconception because Java E is a set of APIs and to run Java E, we need a server. And I, in all my projects, if I look at Spring, they always use something from Java E. I don't think there are lots of Spring projects without Java E. Conrad, Ha, huh. Adam, what's your opinion about Eclipse Collections? Did you have any chance to use it in project production? So I, I like the Eclipse Collection. I like, you know, the people behind, but I never use that because already, you know, I don't use Jakarta Commons Lang, nothing. I try to avoid all the dependencies and have more vacations. And yeah, you are crazy with the chat. You are very fast. So very good. So the next one is, um, if you want to change your career in the future, what would it be? 
hard to tell, I would say, uh, because um, w with computers, this is like limitless, right? I would say this is the, um, already as a kid, so if I saw a computer, everything was boring, but the computer was like something, you know, you could, you could, you know, bend it in any direction, right? So um, I'm really happy right now, um, and um, but I can imagine everything else, really. Um, but but I'm very happy with now. I wouldn't like to change, you know, what what I did or, or what I do right now. Thank you, Marty. Vuizo uh, Vuizo A. I I hope I pronounce your, na your name perfectly, right? How I can pass method function from one web component to the other web components like React props? Um, we never do this because in all my projects we use web components together with. Uh, Redux store, yes, and uh, go to the BCE design. So the components don't know each other, and on every change, all the components are uh, recreated from scratch. So I always use the web components with, uh, uh, yeah, always actually, I always use web components uh, together with Redux. Uh, Arkaza Wilfried, Arakaza, sorry, um, I'm building a monolith up with Crocus AI. So monolith, very good. With Crocus and I want to deploy it to the cloud. Also good. Can I suggest me which cloud provider and which service to choose in order to not to pay a lot of money? Okay, not to pay a lot of money right now, try Oracle Cloud. I think it's the cheapest. Uh, in the longer term, I'm not sure. But right now with the free tier, Oracle Cloud is really good. And um, so, but I'm not, so, but if you would like, you know, you, you, you like, like to play with things and be like, you know, serverless and future-proof and... Um, then I would pick, you know, AWS with AWS Lambda. And the reason being is AWS Lambda was first, very first. And uh, all the other cloud providers, you know, caught up after a few years. And I would say because AWS it was first, most of the core services are really uh, feature complete, or feature, no feature complete, how to call it. Um, you know, all the major use cases are covered. Maybe, maybe put it this way. So overall, Oracle Cloud, you know, like uh, traffic, ingress, egress, uh, and uh, and uh, is Oracle the cheapest? Uh, from the AWS Lambda perspective, it's not called that much. I would say you also will pay nothing or uh, a few euros. So it really depends. So if you would like to have more like real world experience, because, you know, lots of companies using uh, AWS go with Lambda, cheaper solution is Oracle. But now back to our right now. And if you would like to have the best uh, Kubernetes experience, actually the only reasonable cloud for Kubernetes, if you ask me, is Google Cloud. On all, on all other clouds, I wouldn't use Kubernetes. Okay, now, very good. Um, so we covered this, interview questions are covered. Then uh, Mr. Fernando. Fernando asked me, do you use OpenG9 JVM in some production system? I think so. I use OpenGenai a lot because I use Open Liberty and always uh, use the uh, or or suggested, recommended to my client to use the IBM JVM, and I think they're still using them. It, it yeah, it's it's very good JVM, and it also com comes with great um, crack. I, I always forget the acronym. So CROD is coordinated restore a checkpoint. I always I try to say coordinated resource at checkpoint is restore at checkpoint and um, what it is it what it does it it freezes the entire JVM and can restart it this is similar this is similar to snap start um, so and now it's not clear to me when and why I should use this JDK actually we, we, I had the conversation with my client I think last week or a week before there was a, an old project which runs on Java 8 so actually a few years ago I helped them you know to create the backends and now they ask me you now they would like to upgrade what to do and this is not easy answer but there's a great independent comparison website and it's called fuj fuj.org i think no fuj.io of course and in the fuj there is an open jdk hub and we have here download hopefully download and we should find different JDKs. It's a bad idea now, reject all. You see, there are different, uh, we have uh, Coretta from AWS, I think, what is distributions? Uh, Oracle, so Oracle JDK, we have Liberica, let's say, we can have Zulu, and we have the, 
uh, Oracle OpenJDK, right? So um, this is a great website So for comparisons. So now, what I advise to my clients is the following. Um, usually your client has some association with Red Hat or, or, or Microsoft. For instance, in serverless world, if you go to Asia, we use the uh, Microsoft OpenJDK. If I work with AWS, I'm using the Coreto JDK. If I do work with uh, with Quarkus on OpenShift, I use the Red Hat's uh, JDK. And some of my clients already have contracts, so I use you know uh, the the what, whatever my clients have. But I uh, know OpenGenai is great. Um, Zulu from uh, Azul Systems is really good. Um, AWS uh, Coreto is really also perfect because and and. Um, by the way, what's for me very important is the support uh, for this JDK because of patching, for instance. Um, so if you use, for instance, um, a an, an serverless AWS uh, JDK on AWS Lambda, let's say, uh, it is patched for you. So uh, the JDK don't have to do anything. So it really depends on your project, right? And um, what I did in the, maybe Tiago will also you know, watch rewatch the shows. So I would say, uh, five years ago, I always picked, you know, the Oracle JDK because uh, this was the default. It was, you know, the, the, the piece of Sanzo. And so if you have, you know, no idea, you can also pick, you know, the, the Oracle's Open JDK is also fine. So, um, so the problem is we have lots of great JDKs. The difference between the JDKs is mainly, is mainly you know, performance or features which are, which are runtime features, I would say. Yeah, and uh, OpenGenai is really tiny. So if you have memory problems, use OpenGenai. It really depends whether you really have memory problems because um, if you go to serverless route, let's say uh, this depends on cloud provider on uh, on 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 Asia. Uh, in in specific, you know, um, how to call it? Uh, premium SKUs? How they call it? Uh, tiers, I think. The premium tiers? Not not tiers. There's a different name for it. But in the premium tiers, sometimes you know. Uh, if you consume less memory, you pay less. On AWS serverless, you have to buy with memory CPU. So if you have you know, two CPUs, you will run, let's say, Lambda with uh, roughly four gig of RAM, like three and a half gig of RAM you get for, not for free, you have to pay for it, but you will have to, in order to get two CPUs, you have to buy you know, three and a half gigs of RAM. And on Fargate, container is a similar story. You cannot just run you know, five CPUs and one gig. There's like a direct associ association between CPU and RAM. So next question is, what do you think about Google RPC for Java? Uh, yes, I I actually, I don't think whether I ever used really gRPC in projects uh, or I never introduced gRPC in, in projects. And, um, and what do I think? <laughs> I'm neutral, let's say. If I would have, you know, lots of microservices and they communicate with each other and it doesn't make any sense to think in to think in objects or nice APIs and you would just like to call methods, I would prefer Jakarta RPC or gRPC over RESTful interfaces, which are not RESTful at all. So what I really don't like is, you know, if you have projects which call, you know, the package is called REST and you have uh, endpoints or resources inside which basically, you know, the, the path is the method name. Sometimes a little bit changed to be not that obvious, but uh, this is, I would say, better would be in such cases just to use gRPC. I, I liked RMI and Coba a lot, but, uh, you know, for because of the serialization issues, uh, it is a problematic, but it could actually, records could sa save us because records are great parameters and return values, and... Uh, the serialization for record was changed and uh, improved and it's more secure. This could work. And um, you could also, there are, there are small libraries like, um, small libraries, My, oh, by the way, MicroStream is also interesting. So um, MicroStream became Eclipse, uh, MicroStream became Eclipse, um, Eclipse Storage, I think. So um, I know the guys because they run the JCon conference, really nice team. And, um, and what do you what do you uh, what you can do? Um, they claim, well, may claim, uh, seems to be you know reviewed several times, that uh, they have a really uh, secure serialization mechanism. So um, 
Yeah. And if you use, for instance, MicroStream, you could use, you know, RMI or something similar and pass, you know, MicroStream CLIs objects over the wire, for instance. My, RMI maybe not, and maybe not because uh, it, it, it is hardwired with the serialization. But uh, yeah, there are um, interesting options. So I would say, for me, the architecture has to be explicit, right? So either I'm doing RPC or I'm going the RESTful route or GraphQL, GraphQL, but not like mix all of them because it's really confusing. Okay. Thank you. So, uh, Fernando, you're on fire. Um, does running a bare metal Whitefly HA cluster with master slave approach make sense? Uh, I don't think so. Uh, master master could make sense, but what me, what means master slave? Because there's nothing to replicate. Maybe uh, you mean session replication or JMS? Master master or leader leader uh, would make sense, and you would uh, I would use a load balancer in front of it, uh, and which uh, which randomly splits the traffic. And what you uh, what about automate standalone war deployments with Ansible instead of relying on the uh, master domain node? Ansible. Maybe, but why not crazier stuff like, let's say, Terraform? I, I don't like Terraform a lot, but it's more popular than Ansible, let's say, right? So you could create your own Terra, Terraform resource, for instance. And um, But if you have knowledge with Ansible, go with Ansible. Um, yeah, the question is, you know, what do you would like to achieve with it? Because uh, the... Uh, as you probably know, Whitefly ships with uh, API, and you can use Whitefly API to deploy wars, which or works already nice, um, nicely. Uh, so I don't have too much information. What do you like to achieve with the second point? So um, because uh, maybe what do you mean by that? Right? You have multiple nodes, and you will, uh, and they would like to use, you know. Uh, something to distribute the war up, um, across the nodes. Okay, this uh, then what? So it really depends. You know, do you spend a time in project or in a product or what you are building? Because if you have a little bit of time, the main challenge is uh, to have um, how it's called, um, not round robin updates, but uh, this is what happens: is uh, that a you know, new version is updated. And, and the load balancer has to redirect the traffic to the to the new version after some approval. And this is what uh, Glassfish did. I think the company was called Surly, and they donated this mechanism to Glassfish. So what you will have to do is, um, um, the best would be, start a new white fly, completely fresh, with the new war, check it, and then uh, then tell the load balancer the, the, to, to do the new one. So this is actually what most of the cloud providers are doing. And you can automate it with Ansible. Yeah, it's true. And uh, it's better, you know, if you have something in Ansible, start with Ansible. And this was stupid what I said with Terraform because you will have to implement everything with Terraform. And you will have to stay, to manage the state. It seems like you have already experience with Ansible. Then do Ansible. Or why not use Java? So I would actually say, you know, a, a, a small Java CLI with, uh, you know, a natively compiled with GraalVM and you, you get a nice binary. I would say um, this is what uh, I actually automate a lot with Java right now. And uh, this is why I got so many ideas, you know, for, for the shorts on my YouTube channel. I forgot to mention this. So there is a, um, because Java is great, I got lots of ideas. So um, I, I have already several hundreds uh, YouTube uh, shorts. Um, okay. Now, now, now comes a warning sign here, Fernando. Then I make it larger to, so, for newer project, I prefer to think about 12 factors and containers over traditional architecture. I don't know. Ah, you mean this is the traditional architecture and there's something new, okay? Today, th today things get easier as we manage solutions like OpenShift. Yeah, if you don't have manage OpenShift by yourself, it's very good. But uh, if you have to do everything, like, you know, if you are in the cloud, you will have to set up your own OpenShift, then it's a little bit harder. You will have to install, you know, in the cloud the Kubernetes and then run on Kubernetes. So this is the, 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 the uh, funny observation. Um, but on the other hand, uh, also we have legacy projects made before the cloud. But um, no problem, you can run the legacy projects in the cloud as well. Um, it seems to me that view developers understand how Jakarta application servers works. Uh, some of them are deploying Spring on application servers. Yes, which is crazy. I think uh, Spring standalone makes sense or application server makes sense. The mix is uh, really hard. It's like buying Ferrari. Jebos is the Ferrari and installing a second engine on it, Spring. 
plus a second set of wheels. Um, yes, but um, with the Javis and Spring, I would see this differently. So I would say Jakarta E is more like Volkswagen, right? Uh, Golf. You can go shopping. It just just is not very exciting. It is. Yeah, actually, it's a good analogy because golf is like you know the common platform for Skoda, Seat, Audi, everything. So it's like you know the the standard car, which is not really exciting, but it works. And if you go to vacations, <laughs> hey, this is really great. If you go to vacations, I would rather go with golf than Ferrari because you know the chances are higher than I arrive, right? Because uh, if something breaks, I can go to any you know to any uh, garage and I get the repairs. And spring is for me like Lamborghini, Ferrari is something uh, boutique, I would say, and 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 custom, and um, and uh, this is why I would like to say it's not like a spring is worse than Jakarta. E. Is this Jakarta e is just good enough? They are the, the they are the APIs, and I don't care about more because they are just fine for me. It's like you know I will pick a Golf over Ferrari, really, and no kidding. I think if um, if I couldn't sell the Ferrari, let's say the the worth is just you know just by driving. So I couldn't sell it. I, I will have to use it, you know. Then I will actually prefer Golf over Ferrari because I couldn't use Ferrari a lot. And what I suspect is if you go, you know, to shopping uh, every day, you will have to change the tires more often or you go, you have to go to, you know, to the gas station and it will, it will cost you more money, everything. So it actually would be a terrible experience with a Ferrari. And I think with Golf, you get way better experience. So, um, Fernando, I, I agreed with everything, but uh, uh, what we don't agree on the last last part, j -Boss is the Volkswagen Golf and Spring is Ferrari, Lamborghini, what, um, I just know the, the both, what else? An another great expensive car. So, Audi 10 or 12. So, now, let's see, where are we? So, what, oh, chat. Yeah, Google uh, Google Kubernetes engine is awesome. It has to be awesome because uh, Google was, you know, the they not like you know uh, the Kubernetes is based on on Borg, but it was hi highly inspired on Borg. And the developer experience, Kubernetes experience, is really the best on Google. And I'm absolutely not interested, you know, to use Kubernetes on on, on other platforms. Um, is it possible to use Logback with Pyra 6 and Java 17? It is hard to stick together. Uh, uh, Padman, I have no idea because I tried to remove frameworks, uh, logging frameworks. Actually, uh, even um, yeah, on Pyra it, 6 depends, but uh, on, for instance, on Oma Lambda project, we just have system system out print land, for instance, is good enough. So the question is why you would really like to have Logback? Because Logback, yeah, why? Um, Mahmoud, I, I asked me, uh, El, Elson, Elson Barty asked me, what is the easiest tool for load testing? The easiest is JMeter, Apache JMeter. Ah, Padman already accessed. Luca Varghetto, hi to all, Luca. Um, yeah. Hi, and if you like, ask question. Um, in which situation do you prefer to use um, Hyper Engine, as is Hypermedia, as the engine of application state? The first time ever, I actually remembered the acronym. Um, I, I never did it completely because uh, the last mile is crazy, but I will always prefer hate, hate OS for business APIs, at least the, at the beginning. What it means to me is this, this what is this, uh, hate OS, how, how to pronounce it actually? Hate, hate, um, so what it means is hate Oracle application server maybe, right? So <laughs> this also a meaning, but no. Um, what it means is um, hyper hypermedia as the engine of application state. So when to prefer that? So there's this hate OS. Hate OS uh, forces you to think about the business logic. So in to think in objects. So this is object in my eyes the object oriented way to expose APIs. So I would like always to start with that. And, you know, just after 80%, just stop. Because at the end, you will have to provide, you know, links to the resources. And uh, and the idea of this is that uh, the, the entire API is machine readable. And I would say, if you don't have a lot of microservices or you are not exposing a public API for a product, um, it is fine, you know, just to go, you know, the 50% with uh, hate OS. And uh, because uh, the only goal is that the front-end developers don't
don't have to ask too many questions, the backend developers, and both groups have to be productive. Okay, I think, are we done? That's the question. Wait a sec. So we can just close that. So not done, not done. Because 12 factor apps. Um, so um, Fernando, you asked me about 12 factor apps and this I was asked to deliver a workshop recently about exactly this topic. And th these are the old 12, 12 factor apps. I, I think the 12 factor apps, it was actually a marketing stunt from Heroku, as I remember. And if you read this, and we actually covered it several times on, on Airhex TV, from my perspective, every Java e application is 12 factor compatible. So if you run an application server in a container, you get 12 factor apps for free. So there is nothing else to do. So the, the, the next challenge is, I would say, okay, this is just how it should be or how it is. And the question is how it should be, right? So for, for me, the, the, the question is what, what does actually cloud native mean? And for me, cloud native is not, you know, to pick uh, the, the, the Docker image from on-premise and launch it in the cloud rather than improve the situation. So for me, cloud native means I focus more on business and less on infrastructure. So this is, this is actually what, the, what I would like to have from the cloud. So for instance, it would mean Let's say I will have to port, you know, the applications over to the cloud, right? So um, the, the first question is, what services can we eliminate and pick from the cloud? Why? Because I'm already paying for the cloud, so now why not to use more? Um, Low-hanging fruit is security. So the um, authentication and authorization OpenID Connect flow, for instance, can be actually performed by Load Balancer or API Gateway. It doesn't have to be performed inside the application. So we can remove some code and move it you know, off the application to the cloud. Why that? Because I believe that you know, uh, the clouds have lots of resources and the, um, and the services are better tested than our own code. So this is uh, the suspicion or observation. Um, or if you run, you know, uh, let's say, a Postgres database in the cloud, um, then, or you can run a Postgres database in the cl cloud, but um, if you would like to have one, it's not like the cloud has it already. You will have to install the Postgres in the clouds. I mean, install. You have to provision this. You have to tell the cloud, I would like to have Postgres, I don't know, 15 with this um, memory and there is a backup or no backup. This is not like uh, that. Yeah, this is what, will, what you will have to do. And you have to, you know, to, to, to think about backups, maintenance windows, you know, periods of time where there is not that much I.O. So what I would prefer, proprietary managed services in the cloud so, and what it means is that your application will interact with the service just via HTTP. So this means cloud native. All resources, there is no Postgres rather than Cosmos DB, DB or DynamoDB where you access the database using HTTP. There is no Kafka rather than Kinesis or SQS where I'm accessing, you know, the APIs via HTTP um, using, you know, IAM permissions and roles and fully, you know, using the what cloud is uh, or can or, or can you provide the best, right? The best experience. And um, and it doesn't mean we have to go to the cloud. So um, we can or we stay on-premise. And on-premise is complete different architecture decisions. Will I make on-premise and complete different in the cloud? We are almost in the AX uh, uh, IO workshop or AX Live workshop already. And um, th there's um, the, um, for instance, backing services. Treat backing services attached resources. So it already goes here in the in, in this direction. Or execute the app in one more stateless processes. This is actually a AWS Lambda or Azure function, right? So if you think about this, I mean this everything goes to the direction. What I don't believe is lift and shift. I, I don't see you know the added value. There are some corner cases, of course, but this is not this is no improvement. Okay, so we had 12 factor apps. Are shared deployments back? So what I observed. Sometimes in the cloud, there are lots of things which are like almost optional, like, you know, small cron jobs and stuff like that. So you could use, of course, EventBridge or, uh, or uh, Azure Scheduler, Scheduler, I think is the name. But uh, sometimes you need more specific stuff. And I already thought, why not 
to do you know to pick uh, Payara or Whitefly, run it on a, on a, on an EC2 machine, and just you know we can deploy there are lots of wars with small you know utilities like you know uh, maintenance jobs like for instance you know uh, delete S3 bucket or you know start you know scheduling or whatever so you know small things which doesn't matter but then I will it's very cheap there will be you no know, one application server with lots of wars of course it can be in cluster but I never did it but this was just you know an idea for a maybe an, an interesting application of shared deployments still not advisable if you can run you know use event bridge or any managed services you know it is um, but let's say if you if you run you know a, a scheduled job on on event bridge it you can you can ship a java code but this java code will code will have to call you know via http the real business logic or you, that that's a little bit the problem right and if you have application server you can put you know schedule on a java class and this can perform any logic you like uh now mr thomas kuharczyk asked me have you ever got a good enough reason to switch to Hibernate Reactive and Mutiny in any of your projects? Never. And the opposite is true. If I ask the developers why they use Mutiny, they say, okay, because they copy and pasted the tutorial. And I say, okay, you don't have to, to do this. Then they say, oh, this is very good because without Mutiny, it looks nicer. And um, so it doesn't mean there are no, no use cases, but I don't see a use case. I always use the simple Java code and I'm waiting for Project Loom. And um, so now the question is, is there any use case for reactive programming, right? So this is the question. And the answer is absolutely. So what you should, uh, I would say, reactive programming is great for reactive use cases. What is a reactive use case? Kafka is, is uh, Kafka streams, right? So if, uh, if an event arrives in a topic, it is, uh, um, it, will, it is pushed to your Java code. And what happens then is, the um the uh, your 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 collection it looks like a collection your uh, collection wakes up and uh an event listener is invoked or you can you know combine the streams use filter map all the you know java streams it looks like a java 8 stream but it's alive so on every new event it wakes up and something happens behind scenes so for that purpose this is reactive programming but you are doing this without knowing that it actually is reactive right so I would say for such cases, reactive programming is great. I don't think there is a room for reactive programming just to increase increase scalability because hopefully it will be completely solved with Loom. Um, now we covered, I hope, everything. Yes, no questions here. And uh, um, Padman asked me, and um, I use Payara in production everywhere. Now we migrated lots of Payaras to Quarkus because uh, uh, my clients demanded this. But Payara is still great and you can still use it in absolute in production, no problem. I'm wondering which book do you recommend us to read to improve our Java knowledge? Huh. I like to read. I read a lot of books constantly, but I don't think there's a single book, right? Uh, maybe, oh, to improve Java knowledge. Uh, Java doc, no kidding. Java doc is actually really well written. So uh, I would read, uh, if you like to improve your Java knowledge, you know, read just Java doc. Uh, there's a lots of great on the package level even. So even if you pick, you know, click on, 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 on package, Java doc is well described. And if you will, would like to learn new things, there are the JAPs, Java Enhancements Proposal, JAP. Like a JAP 394 is pattern, for instance, of let's say, and these JAPs, uh, they are well written. It's not like a you know, dry language. It's, it is actually well written with examples and you know, new features of Java. So I w maybe this, go with that. Luke asked me, do you know Daniel O? Yes, absolutely. Uh, yeah, it, he wrote uh, articles on Quarkus and, and serverless. And I actually, uh, I think if, even invited him to AHEX-FM and it will happen, Luca. Absolutely. So, thank you. Crazy, it's already May, so I remember you know, our winter editions, and now it's almost summer, and I think the next EAX is, is, is summer, it's crazy time. Uh, yeah, almost summer. Thank you. It was a, a really nice episode, uh, or a nice episode. You, you, you gave me a nice, you asked 
nice, uh, nice questions. And um, what I just forgot was this. Green IT at the end. So this was my slide from the conference. And this is evaluation from Google. And what happened is uh, they found out that Java is extremely energy efficient, or extremely, it's in, the, in number five. Ruby is 35 times, or Python are 35 times worse than Java. Um, we have here, this is the energy, this is execution time, was not as good as the memory consumption, which doesn't matter for my projects, because uh, as I already said, we have to buy CPU with memory, so we have more memory than we can actually consume. So, um, but what I can tell you, Java is really green, and uh, I made fun, fun of green, because. but um, I would say almost all my clients really care about green IT, and they, they, uh, they have, you know, to to think about CO2 consumption, whatever, by law, I guess, because they are really into it. So um, I would say Java is perfectly suitable uh, for cloud and is even green, which makes everyone happy, right? So uh, thank you for watching and then see you in summer. Bye.